You can search the annals of film history, but you will never find a copy of this movie. Then we traveled to Columbia to take a bus ride with a bunch of other people in 1976. Little do we know, we're about to become under assault. And then we take a look at a time when a police officer walked up to a man. He looked disturbed. He looked on edge. And the police officer asked, have you taken anything? The man looks up and says, lied. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. You can obviously tell I sound a lot better. I feel a lot better. I think I actually am slightly allergic to alcohol. Apparently that's a thing. Because I got sick. Like, I didn't go to bed till like, 4 in the morning, and I slept for maybe 2 hours. Oh, it was awful. I, my tummy hurt. My little baby tummy. My mama came over to burp me. That didn't help. My little tummy hurt. It, sucked. it didn't help that I ate a ton of food, either. So, I mean, it was my fault that I got sick. But, oh, just thinking about alcohol. So, I think I might actually be allergic to alcohol. Or, I combined red wine Hard Cider and Steel Reserve, the most wino of all beers. But Steel Reserve is is pretty good. I only drink three times a year. That was the one. I'm not going to drink two more times before December 31st. But I am going to welcome one of our legacy Patreons right now, Natty the Nat. Natty the Nat, little bug flying around, lands on my shoulder. Shake a little hand there, a little proboscis or whatever it is. I hope that's what I'm shaking. Natty, you are going to be our captain, you're going to be our pilot this episode. If you can't support the Patreon, totally understand, just help spread the word about that show. Really, really helps out a lot. So Natty the Nat, let's go ahead and hop in that Jason Jalopy. We're going to drive off to a place many people never thought existed. No, it's not a safe street corner in New York City. This is a film set. We walk in. (laughs) You're like, Jason, film sets exist? Why'd you do that dramatic pause? We walk into this film set, and you very quickly realize, one, this episode is not appropriate for kids, two, I mispronounced anals on purpose, and three, this is a porn set. This is a live porn set, and the director's like, action. We see, like, this girl sitting there, and you're like, Jason, seriously? I'm like, no, 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 this is this is going to get weird. <laughs> not, not, They're not going to fall in quicksand weird, but just wait. So there's this girl. She's wearing, like, a pink ball gown dress. She's sitting on a bed, and in walks Mario. From Mario Brothers. And you're like, what? And I'm like, hold on, hold on. It gets weirder. So Mario walks in. He goes, hey, it's a me, Horneo. That's his name in this for... I guess that's kind of a good pun. His full name is Squeegee Horneo. I don't know where they got the Squeegee. You would think that Squeegee would be Luigi. No, Luigi's name is Orneo Horneo. So they're not really close to the source material here, guys. And they walk in and they start banging. You assumed Princess Peach. This is Princess Perlina. I don't think you really need a sex name with Princess. That is a sex name. That is a porn name. Anyway, so they're banging this chick. And then you hear, ha, 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 ha. And in walks King Koopa. No, this one's actually kind of clever. It's King Poopa. So, I mean, they're close, right? And King Poopa walks in, and he's like, no, it's my turn to bang her, and they all start having sex with this chick. And this kind of just goes on and on and on until eventually the movie ends. Now, this was a real porn movie. It was called Super Horneo Brothers, and it was filmed in 1993. But what's funny, other than that whole setup, is it wasn't Lost Media. People didn't even think it existed. Like, with Lost Media, they'll go, well, I know there was that show on Nickelodeon called, like, Crybaby Lane, and... I remember seeing commercials for it, but I've never found it since. And people start scouring the internet and they find the guy who directed it and all that stuff. No one even knew this movie existed until screen, like really, really late in the game, someone was posting screenshots of Ron Jeremy dressed up as Mario. And they're like, what? What movie is this from? And no one could ever figure it out. People are like, was this like a costume party or something like that? No. What happened was they shot this movie called Super Horneo Brothers. It was filmed in 1993, so that would have been around the time of the Super Mario Brothers movie. And they even had a sequel. So the setup is, if if it needs a plot, King Poopa wants to get into our world. And in the movie, he had to get a crystal, I think. Dennis Hopper was trying to steal this crystal the whole time. He's like, can I smoke it? Can I crush it? Can I snort it? 
It'll just take you to another world. You can blow up the World Trade Center, though. And he's like, I'll do that. That was weird. I mean, as a kid, you're just like, whoa. I remember really liking that movie as a kid because I was an idiot, right? All children are idiots. And let me diverge real quick here. If you, I did this once on accident. I watched Super Mario Brothers, the movie. And then probably about six hours later, I watched Tron Legacy. It's the exact same film. The exact same film. They even, like, the guy gets sucked into the computer, obviously. But even plot points, like, he outrun in both movies. They get away from the bad guys because they go to the Outlands. But they have all these same plot points. And in the whole movie is about the guy trying to get into the real world. And they're fighting over this MacGuffin to do it. It's the same movie. Tron Legacy is much better, even though it's the same plot. But... Super Hornier Brothers. (laughs) This is what I'm supposed to talk about. It's not a movie podcast. Super Hornier Brothers. So in the movie, Dennis Hopper wants to crush up this giant crystal and snort it, and then he'll go into our world and he'll blow up the World Trade Center. That actually happened in the movie. And in real life, unfortunately. He doesn't need a crystal. He doesn't need a data disk from Flynn. He needs a bathtub full of semen. So that's where we're going with this, right? That's where we're going with this. There's a bathtub full of semen, and he's either going to use it to power some sort of machine, or I would assume he would jump into it, because it's a porn set, right? You're not going to have a bathtub full of semen unless he gets on someone. But he falls into it and melts, and that's the end of the first movie. There's two of these. Then there's Super Hornier Brothers 2. Everyone comes to the real world. So King Poopa was actually, like, successful. He, like, re-digitizes. He re-spermatizes in our world. And he wants to have kids, So how do you find kids? How do you find love in New York City? You go find a prostitute. And that's pretty much that plot point. And then a PC computer blows up. A big old CRT monitor blows up. And he gets sucked into limbo. Originally, so really it's two movies that are missing. Originally it was one long movie. And it's funny because this is how the porn industry works. This is so funny. I was reading this quote. I got a lot of this information. Kotaku did a really good article on this. The Long Hard Search for the Infamous Mario Porn. And in this article, here's this quote. uh, The director, Buck Adams, was asked by Midnight Video to trim the 37-page script. That's all they had. That's all you need. Buck Adams was asked by Midnight Video to trim the 37-page script, split the film into two. So that's why there's two of them. They took 37 pages. So each movie's now, what, only 18 pages long? Split the film in two. And he had a shooting schedule, and the studio's like, no way. We, you, you expect us to shell out that much money for a three-day shoot? And he's like, come on, man, this is my magnum opus. This is going to be my Dunkirk. And they go, we don't know what that is. And <laughs> this is back in 1993, as far as they know. He's talking about rescuing a bunch of British people from the beach, but just kind of shake his head, and they go, no. Three days for a porn movie? For two porn movies at this point? That's impossible. We will let you... Shoot these two movies now if you shoot them in two days. So he shot two porn movies in two days. God, he's feverishly up all night. He's writing scripts. He's writing. He's like, oh, yeah, this scene's really good. Then he has to take like a 15-minute break. He's smoking a cigarette. He starts writing again. He's like, oh, yeah, this scene's really good. Takes a 15-minute break. Goes on and on and on. He writes the movie. I don't know if he wrote the movie. I don't know if there was actually a script. Obviously, there's 37 pages of just moaning noises. The movie is envisioned. The movie is directed. The movie is cast. The movie is made. And uh, Nintendo bought the rights to it right off the bat. And it's sealed in a Nintendo vault, if not outright destroyed at this point. And it will never come out now with Ron Jeremy facing all of the sexual assault charges. Like, there was a time when people thought it may come out. But Nintendo's been, Nintendo is very, very particular about their film license because Super Mario Brothers, not even the porn. That movie was so bad. They're like, we're never doing another movie. That's why there's no Zelda movie or Metroid movie or anything like that. The movie was so bad, they will not do any other movies. And so when this came out, you know, the porn industry is like, oh, we can kind of get away with stuff. Nintendo was like, nope, they bought it. But there was always a, a possibility that at some point it may get released or may get leaked. But right now, I, this story by Kotaku is quite a few years old. Right now, there's really no interest in digging it up in full we the reason why we know the plot details that we do is because for a limited time you could have bought it at your adult store but people would buy porn watch it a couple times and then junk it make room for other things on your shelf or when you moved from vhs to dvd you got rid of all that stuff people will go oh i remember seeing that someone i think has a edited copy of the second one 
like they have part of the second one and they've been able to piece stuff together through like interviews with cast members. Ron Jeremy was like, oh yeah, here, I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> the cops, cops are getting ready to break in his door. He's like, let me hurry up and tell you. Let me hurry up and tell you. Isn't that awful? That's so, aw- I mean, it's like, he's up to like 40 charges or something like that. 40 sexual assault charges. But anyway, so there's really no interest now in, in really discovering the movie because in the end, it's just this big old pervert. Uh, running around getting paid to be a pervert on the movie set, but it is a lost film, and it's one of the rare ones that people didn't even know existed. No one was looking for it until a picture of a big old gross dude appeared online dressed as Mario. Uh, Natty the Nat, let's go ahead and hop in the Dead Rabbit rowboat. We're going to leave behind this disgusting... I see you! Not Natty the Nat. Natty the Nat's fine. You, listener, listen to the show right now. I see you inching closer to that bathtub. Don't! don't and you're like come on i want a souvenir for just this one story all those stories you've been on this is the one i want a souvenir from you have a ladle i'm like don't don't dude me and natty turn around we're going to the rowboat girl <laughs> you brought a ziploc bag specifically for this episode we are now in the dead rabbit rowboat it oddly smells like oleander trees i can't really figure out why we are this is a disgusting episode we are headed out we are rowing out to columbia The year is 1976. It's summertime, and it's a nice, sunny day in Santander, Colombia. There's a bus, an old, rickety bus. Sounds like a bunch of dirt bikes. There's actually four dirt bikes tied to this bus, and there's people riding them. There's this old, rickety bus that's going up this really isolated road. It's like lots of twists and turns. It's all wooded and stuff like that. It's another place you want to hang out. But you got to go through it if you want to get to the other side of this mountain, right? So (laughs) you're driving this bus and it's full of people. It's going really, really slow and everyone's just kind of enjoying the scenery or reading a book or (laughs) wondering about the physics of four dirt bikes tied to a bus. And there's a turn in the road. And as the bus is starting to make this turn, someone looks out the side and they go, what in the world is that? And they see a little tiny dude in the bushes. Just looking at him, he has a grin. (laughs) Like, what? That's weird. I even heard him laugh over that, over the sound of those dirt bikes. And other people are now crowding that side of the bus. And they look and they see 20 dwarves hiding in the bushes. (laughs) 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 (laughs)
And people are kind of looking in the woods, probably not going off too far. They're probably looking and they see like 30 dwarves in there, 30 more with spears. And some guy's like, oh, I don't see him. I don't see him anymore. But they said they never found him again. It's funny because it's a story that has a ton of witnesses. We don't have the exact day. We don't have a lot of the stuff. I got this from thinkaboutitdocs.com. We don't have a lot of the information that I really like to make it a specific story, to make it super believable. Thinkaboutitdocs.com got it from Salvador Friextio. And he wrote a book called Los Contactados, which means the, the contacted. Alien, paranormal stuff, things like that. Or the contactors, maybe. It's interesting because there's a ton of witnesses to see it. There's physical damage down to the bus. But we also always have those stories of ghastly hands that take control of your steering wheel in Britain. That's a real famous ghost story. Or ghosts that cause car accidents. And people sometimes use them to describe bizarre accidents in a certain area. It's probably not true. Like the hairy hands of Britain. I did an episode on a long time ago. Cars driving on the street. These hands appear and they grab your wheel and they start shaking it. That road actually is concave. Doesn't look like it, but it's actually a really perilous piece of road. So it's possible that the car is going off and then people are, I don't know, bumping their heads or just making it up. Telling their insurance company, oh, no, 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 I swear to God, I was a good driver. The hairy hands showed up and the insurance agent's like, oh, not the hairy hands again. It could be something like that. It could be something they're using to explain it away. But it's also possible, you got to look at it on the inverse. When we see these car crashes, these accidents, these stretches of road that people say, this is the most dangerous stretch of road in India. This is the most dangerous stretch of road in America. What, ha- what have you? People go, high fatalities, road rage, stuff like that. Why can't we add in, because we already believe in the paranormal, that these things are interfering with our daily lives like that? You have to wonder the next time you hear a news report, and, and God willing, we never hear another one of these again, but every so often you'll hear a news report about like a train derailing or a bus plummeting off a cliff. Could be a technical error, could be operator error, but it could be something that the world of the paranormal does on purpose. And they may do it simply to get a good laugh. The idea of them injuring us amuses them. It's a terrifying story. It's funny because it's a bunch of dwarves, right? <laughs> it was a bunch of like dragon men. And everyone died on the bus, and wouldn't it be as funny? I'd still cover it, but wouldn't it be cracking so many jokes? But it's just an interesting thing. These guys had fun from it. And you actually, it makes you think, do ghosts, do demons? You know, there's always like this world-dominating plot with demons. They're trying to steal our souls to get ready for the final judgment day, the Great War. And ghosts are trying to like live out vengeance or reconnect to the loved one or something like that. What if they're just doing it for the laughs? It's really boring being dead. You've been a two billion year old demon. You want something to do. So you just want to make people laugh. You don't want to make people laugh. You want to make yourself laugh. So you do it by ruining people's lives. Maybe dwarves are like that. Who knows? Maybe gray aliens are like that. Maybe gray aliens, they seem not to have a sense of humor. They're so stoic. Maybe maybe that is the highlight of their existence, abducting cows and cutting out their buttholes. But that's actually a good segue. We're not going to talk about buttholes, but talking about how demons interact with humans, it's actually a good segue. Natty the Nat, let's go ahead and put you in the cockpit of the Carpenter Copter. So, Natty the Nat, let's go ahead. We're actually going to help these guys out, because a lot of times we're jerks to people in stories. Let's put a winch around that bus. We're going to use the Carpenter Copter to get that bus back on the road. And then floor it, floor it. We're like flying through the air. The people in the bus are like, ah, we're doing this whole thing. We carry the bus through the air for a couple hours until now we're having fun. Now we're having fun abducting people. Eventually we drop it off nearby where they were supposed to go. They're like, dude, it's like 500 kilometers away. It's like, yeah, we'll give them some gas. And then we bid them farewell. We are headed off to England, specifically Milham, Cumbria, England. So I think if I know my... If I know my English geography, I don't. But Millam would be the city or the shire, the village or something like that. Cumbria would be the district or the state. I shouldn't even try to do this. England is the country, though. I know that. So I think Milliam is like the village. So in Milliam, it's June 8th, 2013. Natty, land that carpenter copter, and we're going to be walking around here. I actually planned on doing this story a week ago. And I said, I did the episode Samson Forever instead. And I said in that episode, I had something really depressing planned. I didn't want to do it that night because we were uh, paying respects to the Samson the dog. And I was actually going to do this episode yesterday, but I was so sick. I didn't really want to delve into such a dark story. So this story is kind of depressing. It's pretty dark. 
And uh, if you're not into that, it's probably not the best Friday episode either because people it gets you ready for a fun weekend. This story won't. This story is kind of depressing. So if you don't want anything depressing, we can part ways now. For the rest of us, let's go on this journey together. John Jenkin, he's 25 years old. It's June 8th, 2013, and he's hiding under a bench. He's shivering. And a cop walks up to him. The police have actually been looking for this guy. And the cop walks up to him. He puts a flashlight in his face. And he begins questioning this young man. And he can tell he's out of sorts. And he goes, have you taken anything? And the young man responds, lives. 48 hours earlier, it's June 6th, 2013. And he had spent months afraid that he was going to commit violence. Specifically, that he was going to kill his mom and his sister. He began to have these ideas, these intrusive thoughts. But intrusive thoughts and full-blown psychosis is actually a huge gulf. Everyone can have intrusive thoughts, but he seemed to be suffering from a full-blown psychosis. He believed, he truly believed, there was a demon inside of him. A thing we see with people who have uh, serious mental issues is that they self-medicate. They self-medicate, right? And they go, well, you know, if I smoke a bunch of weed, it makes the demon not talk so much. It gives the demon a Jamaican accent. That's kind of cool. You shouldn't self-medicate. He tries self-medicating, and then... He even takes that too far because he thinks his demon's inside of him and he goes, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a bunch of LSD. That's not going to help. That's not going to help at all. I imagine that must be the most terrifying experience at all. You're demonically possessed and you're high on acid, but he takes a bunch of LSD. He gets drunk. Then he goes, okay, I'm halfway there. Like, I've done all this stuff, but since I'm already halfway here, why don't I just kill myself? Because I'm so afraid I'm going to kill my mother and my sister. So, he, in this same time period, he, he's drunk, he's on LSD, he begins swallowing pain pills, goes to drown himself, and while he's drowning, starts to slit his wrists. So, someone was watching this whole progression, it might have been his friends even, but eventually the police come out, they nab him, and it was a suicide attempt, obvious suicide attempt, and he's telling people, I feel like there's a demon inside of me, I feel like there's a demon inside of me. He's taken to Furnace General Hospital. And they interview him, they talk to him. He had just tried killing himself earlier that day. Talking about being possessed by a demon, he's afraid he's going to hurt somebody. Or multiple people, really. They deem him a low risk. You can just imagine some bureaucrat was barely paying attention to what this kid was saying. Oh, no, 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 you're low risk, here you go. Here's a prescription for more acid. What? I didn't even know you could prescribe this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave, you're gone, you're, you're good, you're good. Go deal with your crippling mental issues. Somewhere else. You're low risk. June 7th, the next day, he's hanging out with his friends. He's drinking with them. Again, this guy's fairly young, but you think someone would go, hey, dude, you want to hang out? I know you like tried killing yourself yesterday and you think you're a demon and all that stuff, but I want to be a support system for you. Like, I don't believe that you're actually possessed. I want to be a support system for you. You want to hang out? Yeah, sure. Let's go and drink. Let's go get drunk. You'd be like, what? That was one of the methods I used to kill myself yesterday. But of course, he's trying to self-medicate. So John Jenkins is out drinking with his friends. And at this point, they're hanging around, they're drinking, and he begins to confess to them. I'm the devil. I'm the devil. I have this evil inside of me. I fear I'm going to kill my mother and my sister. And I don't know what to do. Now, on the one hand... That seems very try-hard, right? We've all met people like that. Like, oh, you know, I'm the most sinister man you've ever met. If I didn't know you and you met me in a back alley, you better watch out. And you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, what? Okay, Jeremy. But we've all known that guy, right? But this guy just tried killing himself the day before. So when he's talking about being the devil and he's afraid he's going to hurt somebody, he's crossed that line between playing with his switchblade while the rest of you guys are playing Magic the Gathering, the guy in the corner, you know, I could kill a human and feel nothing. We're like, yeah, yeah, Jeremy, you've said that a hundred times. This round, we're still playing Magic the Gathering. That's all you said this whole round. They really don't seem to do anything about this. He just tried killing it. And I could be wrong. Like, in the articles I read, I think the friends were concerned for him. But we don't see him being readmitted to the hospital. We don't definitely don't see the police being recalled. So they, I'm sure they had emotional issues. Like, I'm sure they weren't. I'm sure it kind of harshed their buzz overall. But as far as I can tell, the police weren't informed. That same night, that same night, June 7th, 
His sister, Katie, she's a 20-year-old woman. She begins telling her friend something similar. She says, I'm kind of worried about my brother. He doesn't look like John anymore. Friend's like, what are you talking about? She's like, I can't describe it, but he doesn't, he doesn't look like him. He doesn't seem like him. He, it, when I look into his eyes, I don't see John. I don't see him. June 8th, the next day, John comes down. It's morning. He comes downstairs. His mom's there. She's 54 years old. It was just the mom, the sister, Katie, and then John. John walks downstairs to do something in the kitchen. And an argument begins between him and his mom. And Katie's in the kitchen as well. And so is their dog. This argument's going on and John is getting upset. He felt like his mother was overbearing. This argument's going on and he walks upstairs to his bedroom. And the mom just turns around and continues doing what she's doing in the kitchen. Katie is continuing to eat her meal. And the dog is just doing dog things on this early morning. Within minutes, he walks upstairs. He comes down with an axe and kills the mom. In the kitchen, cuts her open with this axe. And while he's murdering his mom, his sister is screaming out out loud. Obviously, she's in complete shock. It happens in a heartbeat. The sister's sitting there eating, and the next thing she knows, her mother is split open by her brother wielding this axe. She's screaming. She's freaking out. She doesn't know what to do. John said, I killed her just to stop her from screaming. And after killing the mom and killing the sister for the crime of being shocked at watching her mother murdered right in front of her, he then chops up the dog. He ended up running out of the house. People were alerted to the screams. The police were called out there. They find him, and he gave his line, which admittedly seems like something... I don't want to make it trite, but that seems like something that you would see in a movie. It's an interesting line that he still had the wherewithal to basically quip as a cop was finding a man who just murdered his mother, his sister, and his dog. I'm not giving him extra credit for that, right? I'm not saying it's cool or anything. I just find it weird. Now, he was obviously... Found guilty for all this stuff. This isn't an ongoing case. He's doing life in prison. It's an interesting story because there could obviously be an insanity case here where he was complaining for months about a decline in mental faculties. And even the friend, I'm sure all of his friends could testify. Even Katie's friend could say, yeah, the night before she could tell something was different. But of course, you know, I'm going to go back to the paranormal angle because that's what we talk about on a paranormal podcast, even though we do also talk about true crime. I think, really, he had mental illness, and I think that's the case. But I do find it interesting that the sister was saying that he looked different. It it wasn't just that his eyes looked different. You could tell, like, you could probably say somebody is going through some mental struggles and it shows in their eyes. They have the thousand-yard stare, shell shock, or something like that. He looked different overall. He had a physical different appearance. The way he seemed to her is what she said. He seems different. So that can include everything from the way he walked, the way he sat, the way he interacted with other people. Now, obviously, those could all be complicated by mental illness as well. But it would be terrifying to think that this man for months was fighting a demon for control of his body. And over time, the demon was slowly wearing him down. But it wasn't until he actually tried killing himself when he was at that level of despair that he was reaching out for any life raft, even if the life raft was his own death, when the demon fully took control. Because it was only 48 hours later that he did this. And based on the articles I read, in the original part, he was saying, I think I'm possessed by a demon. I'm afraid I'm going to murder my mother and my sister. The day after he attempts suicide, he tells his friends, I am the devil. The fighting has stopped. He went from saying, I think I have a demon inside of me, to proclaiming, I am the devil. And then the day after that, he ends up committing a demonic act. And I think an even more disturbing angle we could look at on this was, we have a young man who's been fighting this paranormal invasion off for months. He can't take it anymore. He attempts to kill himself. This thing takes control of his body. When he's taken down to this hospital... He's taken in front of somebody checking symptoms off of a piece of paper. A bureaucrat through and through. But this bureaucrat, allegedly, this is I'm making this ending up. So, you can't sue me. This is fake. But just from a horror short story version, you have this young man, John, come into this ward. 
You have this bureaucrat who's been working there for years, just always checking off boxes, deeming people low risk, high risk, what have you. And this person also lost the battle a long time ago. So sometimes they see a client come in, and they seem insane to their neighbors. They're always preaching, always preaching on the street corner, preaching about God's salvation. And this person looks at this old minister and says, high risk, definitely crazy. Who knows what this zealot will do? Sees a mom dealing with postpartum depression. She's talking about dark thoughts and the bureaucrat looks up at her and goes, low risk, send her home. This person weighs life in the balance with the check of a pin. And this person lost their battle with a demon a long time ago, fully infested, and in the perfect position to continue to cause chaos. Because this person would see client after client come into their office and could look at them and know if this person was also in the grasp of a demonic force. So when this person saw John walk in that day, just looked up at him, looked up at the scratches on his arms where he tried cutting himself, looked at the glazed look in his eyes as the drugs were continuing to wear off of him. It's only a slight look. The counselor knows exactly what the answer is as John's walking into the room because the counselor recognizes Something in John. Something familiar. Something like family. And as John sits down, the counselor is already writing down, low risk. Release back into society. It is just one more chaotic element unleashed into the world that's already having a hard time fighting back evil. But that's the counselor's job. That's why they're there. They get paid good money, great benefits, and they get to make sure the foot soldiers are where they need to be to sow demonic destruction. Again, totally fictional. I don't know if any of that's true. I don't know if the counselor is possessed. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys. 